The northern enemy group is firing on Division 46, who is now clear of enemy illumination, but still in the cruiser line of fire. So the destroyers execute turn nine to the attack course. Thatcher turns too soon and collides with Spence. Thatcher suffers damage, but both ships are able to continue. Foote, still attempting to rejoin, receives a hit on the starboard quarter and is out of action. To clear Division 46 from the line of fire and to close the northern group, Cruiser Division comes to north. Eight-inch shell splashes now reveal the presence of heavy cruisers and explain why the enemy has been content to keep his distance and not close on us. No gun flashes are visible from the direction of the enemy. Denver and Cleveland shift fire to a target in the center group. A large explosion is seen on this target. The Columbia opened fire on a target in the southern group. Montpelier is effectively pounding the northern group. The leading cruiser changes course sharply to the right to avoid collision with a ship dead in the water. It is the foot who reports a torpedo hit in the steering engine room. She is completely disabled but can keep afloat. The torpedo either came from a submarine or the northern enemy group, in which case it was released before 0249 and ran a distance of 22,000 yards at approximately 36 knots. The torpedo salvo was probably directed at Division 46 on its first sortie to the west, and their fortunate retirement southward at 0253 carried them out of range, except for Foote, who stopped one. Apparently, the foot followed the rule set by all stragglers. All targets of the northern group are dead in the water. In order to close the center group and to cut off his approach toward our transports, the cruisers reversed course to the south. A thought constantly in the mind of task force commander and his staff was an attempt by one or more of the enemy units to make an end run into the waters of Empress Augusta Bay. At about this time, according to report of Comdesdale 45, two pips were noticed on the PPI scope that were in fairly good position to make a torpedo attack on our cruisers. And he could not understand how two Japs could have arrived in such a position so quickly. An IFF failure. Checking with Dyson, he learned that in the retirement, Division 45 had lost Stanley and Claxton. Luckily, he was able to locate and identify them as the two pips he had seen. At this time, he had two choices. First, to carry out his original intentions and head for the enemy with only two ships. Or second, delay until Stanley and Claxton could rejoin. He chose the latter, swung right and headed south so the returning ships could reverse and reach their original stations. So far, the cruisers were faring well. The enemy had not registered a single hit, though his fire had been very heavy. However, at this time, the enemy star shell illumination became most effective. A string of brilliant flares appeared ahead on the disengaged port bow. Course was changed 30 degrees to the left to put them on the starboard bow and escape being silhouetted. Resumed course 180 with the flares between the cruisers and the enemy battle line. This did not interfere with our radar controlled firing, but definitely slowed up the enemy fire. Counter-illumination was ordered, with star shells short of the enemy. An excellent procedure against an enemy using optical observation. Flares from enemy planes now augmented the illumination. Even the familiar red stars were released, indicating to the Japs that our formation was made up of cruisers. According to report of Comdes Deer 45, this illumination was the most brilliant any of us had ever seen. They appeared to be stars properly placed to silhouette the cruisers. They descended at a much slower rate than any we had used. 
These stars served our force as well as the Japs in that it helped the attacking destroyers to check the location of our cruisers.